The Wow Factor, More Adventures in Revival. Chapter 11, How to Pastor a Revival. Interviews with Revival Leaders. In the 1990s, several revival centers were hosting conferences on revival. Their theme largely had to do with the early chapters of this book. How do we attract the presence of God? I remember a conversation I had with a denominational leader who described the mid-90s as one of the most exciting times to be a denominational leader in his state. Every phone call seemed to bring another report of revival breaking out in another church. However, the reality of the 90s was that revival ended for most of the churches that had experienced it. It became a part of their history, but not a part of their DNA. So I asked the question, how does one successfully pastor a revival or outpouring? As an evangelist who has been a part of a number of significant moves of God, I could offer my own perspective, but I thought it would be of greater interest to get the thoughts of pastors who have piloted their churches in the white water of revival. So this chapter will consist of a series of interviews I did with such pastors. I'm going to approach this chapter as if we were sitting together in a room and these spiritual leaders were responding to my questions. Let me begin by introducing the participants. I think it is fair to say I have a unique relationship with each of these men. Seth Fawcett has been the lead pastor at Hope Center in Lower Hutt, New Zealand since the mid-90s. Prior to that, he served on the staff of that church. As mentioned earlier, I personally preached a 20-week meeting in 2000 at his church and a 17-week citywide meeting in 2001 where his church was the foundation for the meetings. Graham Renf served as the senior associate pastor at Hope Center for much of the last 15 years. He has just stepped down from a full-time position to give more time to itinerant ministry. In the early 90s, the church he was leading in the town of Danny Verk experienced a revival so that he will speak from both situations. Tony Collis serves as the lead pastor of the Hope Center in Levin, New Zealand. In 2008, he was the lead pastor of the Assemblies of God Church in the same town. And during that time, I preached a 19-week revival at his church. Participant number four is Randall Burton, the lead pastor of Northview Church Assemblies of God in Columbus, Indiana, which he founded more than 20 years ago. He is also the author of a revival book entitled River Rising, published by Evergreen Press. Although I had preached for him earlier in 2010, it was the outpouring in Terre Haute that catalyzed uh, what God was doing in his church. He has been in revival since 2011 or so. And finally, Keith Taylor is the lead pastor at Cross Tabernacle in Terre Haute, Indiana. He has served in that role for 20 years. This is the church where I have been preaching outpouring services since 2010. The story behind the stories. Michael Livingood, question. We often describe revival, outpouring, as a sovereign move of the Spirit of God, and I fully support this description. However, such a description does not suggest revival occurs in a vacuum. There is always a story behind the story. That story includes events going on in the life of the leader of a revival as well as in the church. 
In your case, what was happening personally before the revival outpouring took place? Seth Fawcett responding. In the 80s, I was the youth leader at Hutt Christian Covenant Center. During that season, we began experiencing a move of God which led into some extended meetings with an evangelist. Our church had a Pentecostal heritage, but not a revival practice. Meetings were stopped, and the question became, why did we stop? This motivated me to be careful not to close meetings too soon. People often stop too soon because of a failure to see the big picture. The reasons seemed valid at the time, but in hindsight, they were not as important as the revival. Another important moment for me was the decision to leave a secular career to pastor the same church. At the time, I was among the top wage earners in New Zealand, so the call of God brought a sense of expectation in my life. Another thing was the willingness to be a fool for Christ. I was challenged with, am I willing to be a fool for Him? The Lord was teaching me how to be counter-cultural. For example, in the Kiwi, New Zealand culture, boys do not cry. But it was important uh, in my journey to learn how to be countercultural. People often resist when something is countercultural. Teaching people to yield to the Spirit is challenging. Keith Taylor responding. My grandfather was a Church of God, ten a Cleveland, Tennessee evangelist. He passed away when I was very young, but before his death, he imparted this calling into my life. My grandmother continued to nurture and seed the calling of God into me until she passed away, and then that impartation set upon my wife oil anointing and all. She continued praying until I finally submitted to the call of God on my life. During this time, I had an open vision. I could see a church service and the back of a preacher. This was a few years before I stepped into God's call and I was not totally living right. In fact, when this vision occurred, I was sitting at the kitchen table with my guitar and writing music. Suddenly, I was thrust into the vision and I chased that vision for many, many years. The 1996 Brownsville Revival totally changed the direction of my life. We stepped out of the pastorate and into evangelism. The anointing changed, passion drive, and vision changed. During that time, I had yet another daytime vision of change coming in God's anointing on my life. This was as I was driving with my wife on Interstate 70 after a Sunday morning service at Abundant Life Worship Center in Clay City, Indiana. I suddenly saw an angel descending from the sky. Look at me bend down and open a large wooden chest. As soon as the chest was open, what looked like golden smoke and flakes suddenly came rushing upward out of it. And as soon as this took place, the angel spoke and told me this was for me, that from this point on, your anointing and direction has changed. Sometime after that, I was attending a service with the Brownsville team in Cleveland, Tennessee. The church was full to overflowing and I was unable to get into the building. However, the church air conditioner broke down and they opened the windows to provide ventilation. A pastor named Carlos Cox and I went to a window covered by a pine tree. 
as we stepped into that area, it was like a private closet. We hung in that window and listened to that meeting for over four hours. Suddenly, we found ourselves standing in the altar area, and I still did not know how that happened. Pastor John Kilpatrick and Evangelist Steve Hill laid hands on us and prayed. And that's all I remember for some time. A few days after that meeting, God opened doors for me to step out of pastoring the Clay City Church of God and into full-time evangelism. This, in turn, was a setup for me after a few years to take the pastor to Terre Haute First Assembly of God, now called Cross Tabernacle, where I've just stepped into my 19th year as pastor. Graham Renov. I had come to a place where there was a desperate hunger within me. I knew it was God, but I did not know what I was looking for. And I was still not satisfied. My wife and I knew we were called to pastor, but we did not want to do church as we had been doing it before. I knew from Scripture there was so, so much more than we were seeing. I decided to press into God by increasing my prayer life. I began to spend three hours at the church in prayer four or five days a week from 9 a.m. to noon. After about 20 minutes of this, I would feel prayed out. So I would go into speaking in other tongues. I still felt a lot of frustration, but God encouraged me to keep going. During this time, there were encounters with the Lord that would keep me focused. After I had finished a pastoral visit one day, the Lord said to me, you can build the church your way, or you can build the church my way. You can build a church with your skills, or you can chase me, and I will teach you the kingdom. He went on to say, your way will work for a season, but the foundation is poor. My way will build a stronger foundation, but it will be harder because it will cost you your life and because it will be built in intimacy. Two weeks after that, I had a repeat encounter as I was driving where God asked me, have you made up your mind yet? I had to pull over to the side of the road to weep. About that time, my wife and I learned to pray without ceasing. If Paul could do that, we figured we could learn to do that too. A season of revival came to the church. It lasted about three years or so. It was the sweetest time of our life. And with that revival came a number of issues. Those issues will be shared later in this chapter. As a result of those issues, I had no interest in revival any longer. I had been hurt, and I wanted nothing to do with it. In 2000, while I was ministering in the Hutt Valley at a Presbyterian church, I was told a about a revival that was happening at Hutt Christian Covenant Center, now Hope Center. Curiosity brought me. I came very late to the meeting, and when I saw the clothing and the hats, Smith Wigglesworth type of hats that the people were wearing, I thought for sure I was in the wrong church. I told the Lord, I'd already seen this before, and turned to leave. But Pastor Seth Fawcett stopped me and asked if he could pray for me. When he did, I hit the floor, which I did not like. My heart had just been touched, and I did not want that to happen. But I knew immediately that this was what I had been looking for. When I crawled to my feet, I went straight to Seth and said, why you? Why here? Why now? 
He said he did not have an answer to that question. But he and Michael Ivingood prayed for me again, and I was wasted for three hours. And that encounter ruined me for life. Randall Burton. In a nutshell, at that time, I was feeling real loneliness and despair. We'd gone through a church split or a church splinter. Our church had been growing numerically, but I felt disconnected from other ministers and ministry. I felt like we were just going through the motions, and because of the church issues, I was having a bit of a struggle personally. I felt like I had no sense of a spiritual father. In fact, I felt like a spiritual orphan. I asked God, why don't I have a spiritual father? His response was to tell me, be the father you did not have, and I would take care of the rest. I attempted to do this, but honestly, I still felt empty. In early 2010, we took time off to go to California. We were asking ourselves a series of questions. Who are we? What are we doing? During this sabbatical, the Lord said to me, you are anointed wherever you go or whatever you do. But I discovered this did not mean God was validating all the actions we might take. I then spoke to my district superintendent or state denominational leader about what was going on because I still felt a need for more. I was looking for counsel. He connected me to Michael Ivingood, who began to answer the questions of who I am and the desire for a spiritual father. During that critical time in my life, I found both destiny and fathering. That phone call changed my life. Really, it was like critical mass had been reached for me. And then Tony Collis, I was freaking out. I had been involved in planting house churches in both Asia and New Zealand. I was quite happy with what we were doing. But we received a prophetic word about a left turn. The Lord told us to close doors on what we were doing. I felt the pastor at Levin was going to ask us to come and help them on staff at the church, which he did. God made it clear we were to go and work with them. For two years, we were on staff and knew that the pastoral baton was to be passed on to us. We knew we were in the right place, but we had no idea what was going on. Michael Livengood. Tony, in 2000 and 2001, you were an itinerant evangelist. You and your wife were a part of the meetings in Hutt Valley. Can you talk to us about that season? Tony Collis, those meetings were life-changing. God was doing stuff I had never experienced before, supernatural stuff. Lynette, my wife, was going to meeting after meeting and receiving prayer in every meeting. She was transformed in front of me. She had always been supportive and looked after the children while I traveled and preached. I felt to strongly encourage her to attend the meetings and I stayed home to take care of the kids. Those meetings were a huge boost for Lynette. I saw her transformed. She became so hungry for the things of God. She was walking in a new authority with the pursuit of God. Her joy exploded. Some nights she would come home from the revival services and when she would get into bed, it began shaking. Some of this was way outside of my box. But I could not deny the signature of God all over it. 
I experienced encounter upon encounter. I guess you could say we became victims of our revival experience. It changed how we saw ministry and life. Michael Ivanka, I am a little blown away with some of your personal stories. Wow. Let's shift from personal experiences and talk about your churches. What was going on in your church prior to revival breaking out in it? Seth Fawcett. There was an expectation that God was going to do something. You cannot go into revival without a sense of being called. People who enter revival out of soul get burned out. We started holding a Saturday night prayer and worship time from 6.30 for one hour. As already mentioned, the church had a history of prayer, including a 50-year, 24-7 prayer meeting. Seth again. Well, we would worship for 20 minutes or so and, and then begin laying hands on people to receive a Holy Spirit baptism and freedom in the Spirit. The goal was to see people filled with and be fluent in the Spirit. We did these meetings for two years. We had heard about revival, although we had not seen it. So we were going after it. In those meetings, as well as others, I told revival stories. At first, these were stories from other places until God gave us our own stories. The telling of these God stories created hunger within the people. Culture is created by thoughts and words. By telling these revival stories, we made revival normal rather than something seen as abnormal. Too many places see revival as abnormal. This was a case of redefining normal for us. We also began putting up big banners with revival themes such as, Lord, we have heard of your fame. Uh, revival slogans and language became a part of the church's culture. We were building hunger. Hunger for revival comes from the pastor and leadership. The pastor must model this. If the pastor is not hungry, Revival will not come, even if the people are hungry. Too many moves of God are stymied because of the comfort zone of the leaders. Leadership is not always comfortable because leaders are always going into new territory. As a leader, I had to be prepared to pay whatever price was necessary for a move of God. A commitment to the journey became essential. Sometimes, even family and friends will not understand what is in your heart. For me, I believed you would never make progress until the pain of the known or the pain of the status quo is greater than the pain of the unknown. I understood some moves of the Spirit are countercultural. But isn't Christianity supposed to be counterculture? We must accept that before revival comes. Revival will never fit inside of the existing church culture. We began training key people in the things of the Spirit. We were blessed in New Zealand with the ministry material of New Zealand evangelist Bill Saritsky. We took advantage of his insights to train people. We were preparing the way of the Lord by removing the obstacles. Some of those things we had to deal with were spiritual pride and questions like, what is the point of this? Or statements like, but we've seen this before. We really had to work on the buy-in. Because of the move among youth in the 80s, 
They had a taste for revival that could be built upon. This was a key. The under 30s were not so set in their ways that they could not be molded. Keith Taylor. Before I was called to be the pastor of First Assembly of God, which is now called Cross Tabernacle, a prayer meeting was held. A prophetic word was given from Isaiah chapter 54 about enlarging the tent. The message God gave me for the Sunday I candidated was from the same text. About three months into being the pastor, the Lord woke me with instructions to come to the church sanctuary for prayer. He spoke to me that to those who would seek Him, He would give His glory. About six months later, Fred Aguilar prophesied, Can you hear the cry? The cry of the one who is to give birth. The time of delivery is nigh for the midwife to give birth. The husband is enlarging the house to make room. There are many who will be delivered. Prepare thyself. Prepare thyself. Prepare thyself. For they shall come. It is time to prepare. I felt led to call the pastoral staff, deacons, and spouses to accountability. I think it is fair to say much of the journey from then until 2010 was all to do with preparation. A variety of guest speakers would be used by God to reinforce the prophetic word. We were led to establish a variety of Ministries to the Community, Teen Challenge, Single Parents Christmas, Walking in the Drunk Parade or the Homecoming Parade for Indiana State University, Chi Alpha Campus Ministry, airing of our services by TBN, providing the police department with Bibles, prison ministries, to name a few. Former pastor and mentor Jack McIntosh shared a dream God gave him about an oil well bubbling up in our foyer. The oil was loaded onto train tankers, which were backed up to the church. That oil was taken throughout the world. At first, we thought the fulfillment of that dream was internet ministry. The streaming of our services uh, has gone worldwide with some services being viewed 10,000 times. Now, we realize it was larger than we thought. In January of 2010, we joined nine other churches in a citywide divine experiment. We are fasting and praying for a citywide presence of God. The closer we got to August 2010, we sensed transformation was in the air. <clears throat> and then you came, Michael, to preach in August. After a week of meetings, you went to Germany. I heard about the Bay of the Spirit revival in Mobile, Alabama, and I felt led to take the staff down there. During that meeting, the Lord spoke to me about the third service and told me that I would know then if this was the season for the fulfillment of the promise. I asked you if you could return to be here for that service. On that day, it became evident this was the season. Graham Renoff. The church in Danny Virk had gone through a split a few years before I became the pastor. Allegations of sexual abuse and more were brought against people in the church, which had become a shadow of his former self. The previous pastor was still there. During this season, there was still a measure of presence and atmosphere. There was a willingness to go after God. Then the pastor left. Another came for two years and then he left too. 
By then, the church had dwindled to a relatively small group who asked me to become the pastor. The manifest presence of God became our primary objective, although we did not use that term then. We learned that if the leader does not pursue the presence of God, the people will not pursue it either. Worship reached a new height, and that was followed by miracles. The Danny Verk break was on a wintry Wednesday night. When I left the building after a prayer meeting, I discovered my people outside, on the ground, in the frost, crying out to God. Prayer meetings have been attended by only me and one other person for over a year. And then within months, every family was represented. This happened without pressure to attend the meeting. The stories from the prayer meeting grew hunger. Hunger was fundamental. Nobody wanted to return to the past. We were a broken people that God had put hunger into. He had to birth it. Passages like Jeremiah 29, 11 and 2 Chronicles 7, 14 were important to us. Michael Livingood. The revival you've been sharing with us actually occurred in Dannyburg, New Zealand in the early 90s. Is that correct? Graham Renner. Yes. This happened about three years before the Toronto outpouring, so we did not even know what that was. At the time, we had little understanding of what we were experiencing. Randall Burton. I was born again in a revival in a Baptist church and filled with the Holy Spirit in another revival. After yielding to the call to ministry, the training I had for ministry included learning a variety of current church trends. We planted the church in 1995. In the planting, we looked at various models, such as courageous leadership, purpose-driven churches, and so on. We developed a hybrid church where we were sort of between seeker-sensitive and purpose-driven, with a desire to be spirit-open. We were a church driven by horizontal relationships more than the vertical relationship. We were highly relational as a church. We had lots of programs, and we were way ahead of our times with our use of media. In hindsight, we had lots of appearance, but no substance. Then, we went through a painful church split. The split forced me to reassess our church, and I realized we had lost the vertical. Tony Collis. During my years as, a tenor, as an itinerant evangelist, I would speak at Levin Assembly of God from time to time. It was one of those places where you would catch a whiff of something special that God wanted to do there. So when I became the senior leader, I had an anticipation of something about to happen. Prayer became a priority for us. The men especially were key in this. We had been involved in what had been a very vital ministry. We had seen thousands of house churches planted. I strongly believed God had not moved us to live in, to just become an average pastor of an average church. So I was expecting something special. Our years of ministry among house churches gave me a love for the small, while my experience with congregational-based revival gave me a love for the big. So we were full of hunger and expectation. But I will 
have to say, I had no realization of what was going to happen. On that Sunday you preached for us, the whiff of the oily rag of revival was there. Michael Livigan. Okay, we have looked a bit at your personal background and a bit of what was going on in your church before revival came. Let's talk more specifically about the revival or outpouring in your church. Can you name two to four things that seem to be important to bringing revival in your church? Keith Taylor. First, prayer was the key. This included both personal and corporate prayer. For 19 years, I have been led to be on the church property between 4 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings, praying and anointing the property with oil. Not only did I practice prayer personally, but I was led to teach and lead the church into a weekly prayer service. Michael Leithingen, let me interject for a moment regarding two things. I understand the importance you place on anointing with oil. I am aware you anoint every pew with oil personally. I found that out by laying my hands on those same pews and discovering the oil. I would also observe that your weekly prayer service at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning is one of the most effective prayer services I have been involved with. Keith Taylor again. I believe the unction in the pulpit was also important. Solid Holy Ghost led preaching and teaching sets in place deep conviction and hunger for righteousness. I believe it births action in the pews and a heart for the lost in the people. It imparts a hunger for discipleship. The third element, and this is so important, is atmosphere or God's glory presence. Perhaps we can explore what creates atmosphere later. But the fourth element I would suggest is something I call organic placement. This is where hands-on evangelism unfolds in the midst of the people. Ministries, both inside and outside the body, take place. These are Holy Spirit-initiated and operate with a five-fold foundation, direction, and spiritual oversight. Graham Reniff. I don't think there's any question about this for me. Hunger and prayer were the two key things for us. What you focus your attention on through the eye gate and ear gate is very important. I was reading books looking for answers to the cry in my heart. And God began to bring to my attention stories of historical revival. Michael Leithengood. Were those stories you read only for yourself? Graham Reniff again. No. I began sharing those revival stories with my people. I shared with them what I was discovering. I was reading about the Argentine revival, the, the Welsh revival, the Azusa Street revival. Neither Toronto nor Brownsville had broken out yet. I was reading about men God used in the past. I found books that a church was chucking out, throwing out. Men like William Branham, Smith Wigglesworth, Evan Roberts, William Seymour, and others. I know that Branham went off the rails at one point, but God spoke to me through the ministry of his early days. Reading these stories fed my hunger. Sharing them became hugely important for the church. Our hunger led to prayer. I will never stop talking 
about revival. It fans the fire. Randall Burton. That hunger thing Graham is speaking of resonates with me. I think the first thing that was important for me was simple desperation. I had reached the place of me becoming nothing for him to be something. Before revival, I announced to the church I was coming out of the closet. I told them I was going back to my revival roots. Another pre-revival for me was to connect with the right people. Now, the Lord brought into my life people like Michael Livingood, Graham Reniff, who unpacked prophetic and worship teams for us, Fred Aguilar, who would help bring revival to the church. I learned that revival brings challenge. Graham, like a father, talked about where we were and where we were going. He encouraged me that we had the goods. Don't drop the ball between meetings. I think that attending the revival, which became the Terre Haute outpouring, was very important for me. And then for all the church, attending the outpouring at Terre Haute not only uh, imparted or released something inside of me, but it also brought an introduction to Keith Taylor, who has become both a mentor and a close friend. Those relationships introduced me to the Road to Glory Conference in Rochelle, Illinois, which challenged me to go from visitation to habitation, to become a glory-filled church. I met people like the Dunlop brothers from Northern Ireland who sharpened my understanding of prophetic and apostolic ministry. Yeah, I would say personal desperation and right connections. I needed to become connected to those who were further into the river than I was. And that messed up my denominational hairdo. God had to allow me to wallow on the floor because that was where his life was. He was on the floor. So God put me on the floor. God had to get me drunk and messed up. It was important that I understood I was not the Pope of church life. Michael Ivengood. Obviously, I believe that revival is the most wonderful thing that can happen in the life of a local church. However, revival is not without its challenges. I once spoke to pastors at a revival conference on the good, the bad, and the ugly of revival. So what would be some of the biggest obstacles you faced to either the arrival or the sustaining of revival? Seth Fawcett. People will filter what happens through the soul, forgetting that spirit is contrary to soul. Teaching is required to help people learn to yield to spirit rather than soul. Voices of opposition will arise during revival. Often, these voices are more concerned about the comfort of the soul than the progress of the spirit. This is a major challenge for pastors. Many will give the voice of soul greater prominence than the voice of spirit. Often we are more programmed to listen to the voice of the soul. Pastors are often programmed to do exactly that. A third obstacle is listening to the wrong voices within the church and within a network or denomination. We saw that jealousy arose in some quarters, especially in the network, or perhaps it could be better understood as misunderstandings on the part of the opposition. People want God to move. But we want him to bless what we are doing rather than doing 
what God is blessing. We must adjust to the Spirit and not require the Spirit to adjust to us. Keith Taylor. Oh my. Here are some things we had to deal with. An immediate demonic, religious, critical spirit will surface. Always be a factor. Carnal activity within the church also surfaces. And by that, I mean hidden sins, old wineskin mentality, comfort zone protection, ownership mentality. This will especially manifest within those who were raised in the current atmosphere before glory broke out. You will need to prepare your people for demonic buffeting of the saints, hungry for more of God. Don't be surprised at the constant maintenance in the area of praise and worship. There will be a constant flesh versus spirit battle. The enemy will look for anything he can use to stop the flow of outpouring, anything to break the cadence of the Holy Spirit anointing, anything to stop a breakthrough in praise and a warring worship. Revival also brings constant financial challenges in many areas. For example, in the early days of the outpouring, we had to replace major air conditioning units. More use of the building brings greater building maintenance issues and other increased challenges. Another issue is uh, the length of services and the number of them. I call it the demonic awareness of time. How many services, when, and how do we adjust the schedule? Closely related to this is the challenge of keeping church life healthy. As a pastor, you will be concerned about the daily needs of the church. A part of this is learning how to structure the outpouring culture into the body. This, of course, will bring growing pains. Some of these will be good and some bad, but it will be a part of the journey. Sifting does and will take place in the church. Praying for godly wisdom became a priority. We found revival brought community awareness in totally different areas. The religious community may respond with jealous spirits and antichrist spirits. Some parts of the evangelical community, for example, responded very negatively to our speaking in unknown tongues. But we also experienced other positives, like hunger, a city church heart will come forth. A greater unity and agreement will manifest itself by an awareness and activation of unified prayer times. I have been praying for over 15 years with a number of both evangelical and Pentecostal pastors. Not only has that continued, but additional prayer meetings uh, within the Pentecostal preachers have developed. Not everyone will get on board, but work with those who will. Graham Renov. My first response was to think of the wet blankets that could come into our lives and tempt us to let the fire go out. We must not stop praying, chasing, and telling stories during the hard times until we reach the exit of the valley. The revival in Danny Verk did blow apart. As I look back, I think one of the biggest obstacles was that I did not know how to be the new wineskin that would carry and maintain the new wine. 
You know the teaching behind the new wineskin versus the old wineskin. We were probably impacted by a lack of knowledge. I assumed this new revival would be my life forever. I felt like I was not walking in an earthly realm, but in a heavenly one already. While I do believe God intends this as a normal lifestyle, there is more to it than just desiring it. Let me try to explain what happened to us. The suddenly, for us, was like an initial explosion of a gas container. We carried on in the energy of that explosion for a few months. And it began to taper, for lack of a better word. I do not believe God intends for a revival to get derailed. How we handle that taper is very important. Even during a revival, life will go on within what God is doing. Family life, pastoral care, but that petrol bomb feels all-consuming. Nothing else matters. We did not want to leave services, even at 2 a.m. But tiredness does come in, and you have to balance the desire for the petrol bomb with the realities of life and kingdom building. Religious, pharisaical thinking and so forth kept getting in the way. We had to adjust to the new thing God was doing. Professionalism is dangerous. Some of this thinking begins to kill the move of God. How do we become new wineskin? Certain things in revival cannot be placed in a box. One obstacle we faced was, was the children's church workers. Uh, growing tired of looking after kids and feeling like they were missing the move of God. We tried to set in place a plan where the workers ministered to the kids for one hour and then the parents were to take responsibility. But the parents were so lost in God, the kids almost got killed. Our church was on a main road and one night one of the little girls who was no longer being watched over was caught attempting to cross that road. Some stranger stopped her and brought her back into the church. Struggle is necessary but the danger is in driving people and we began to struggle with spirit versus flesh. We experienced the danger of neglecting basics, such as cell group meetings. One challenge was balancing the need for fellowship with revival. Some people will leave the church, which causes a pastor to become concerned because of this loss. Pastors need to help people understand purposes of God. Sometimes people want only the joy without responsibility. So we must teach them how to balance the two. Stubbornness and being unteachable have no uh, have an impact. So we must teach them how to balance the two. Stubbornness and being unteachable have an impact. Another issue is the temptation to drive rather than lead. Self-centeredness is my own spiritual gratification becoming more important than the welfare of the church. There is a danger of wearing people out. There is also a danger of turning revival into an event rather than having the presence. We struggled to find the balance of not burning out versus the danger of distraction and losing momentum. 
Sometimes, to avoid wearing people out, we run the risk of losing momentum. Balancing this is huge. We learned it is not enough to keep a form of revival and lose the substance. It is always man that hinders the move of God. We have to be prepared to admit we do not know all of the answers. Randall Burton. Revival itself became an obstacle. And by that, I mean understanding the terminology. We had to help people's understanding of certain terms. Uh, the word revival can become an issue. I searched the scriptures to get a better handle on what was happening to us so that I could explain it to our people. For us, outpouring must become who we are, not what we do. I personally cannot live without this. This is my DNA. And reading the revivalist helped me. My personal inability to understand what was happening was an obstacle. Honestly, this is where people like you, Michael, were a big help. You provided language that can help us to understand. I found a lot of people were making river noises, but they were not going deep themselves. Unless you are swimming in the river yourself, you cannot understand the sound, the depth. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls. And you cannot take people where you have not gone yourself. Guides know the river better than the tourists they are leading. It is one thing to go to the altar of repentance and another thing to take people beyond that into the depth God wants them to go. You can read about revival to the point where you sound like an expert, but, not, but knowing about revival does not mean you are experiencing revival. I discover that information is not impartation. Reading without activating does not pr produce revival. Activa acti activating it includes starting where you are and beginning to practice the presence of God. I discovered that you cannot teach people from the riverbank. There are no lifeguards on a riverbank because the river is always moving. You cannot teach people how to swim without getting into the water yourself. Trial and error are important. Check the clothes of your leaders. Are they getting wet themselves? Your history is a predictor of revival. Tony Collis, I came to realize there will be surges of the Spirit resulting in a real manifestation of the flesh. The atmosphere of revival confronts works of flesh and brings scum to the surface. A real process of sanctification was taking place and this work was happening in me as well. This brought a growing gap between those moving forward and those occupying only the ground where they stood. As a pastor, I wanted everyone involved. But sadly, some decided to say no, and that decision became the beginnings of a place of two camps. Some began to say, who are all these new people? Why do we have to have all these new people, as if it was an evil thing. Michael Ivangun, I have a feeling that some of these very transparent things you gentlemen have shared will be interesting and helpful to other pastors and leaders 
as they traverse the white water of revival. Let's move on to a slightly different perspective. What three or four things have you found to be essential to sustaining revival? Seth Fawcett. First, we must adjust to the Spirit rather than making the Spirit adjust to us. This begins with those of us in leadership. For me, this includes a lot of praying in the Spirit. Where many come to church to get drunk in the Spirit, I plan to come to church to stay drunk. Romans chapter 12 declares that leaders are to lead diligently. And this starts in the Spirit first. So we have to learn to minister to our faith, love, hope, joy, personally. As a leader, we must learn to feed faith, starve doubts, feed hope, and starve fears. Feed love, starve indifference. Feed your joy. One of the ways I do this is to receive laying on of hands. In doing this, I am stirring up my own hunger. For me, this puts petrol in my tank. I also have to watch who I surround myself with. Separate yourself from negative people. I think that, that, I think that is easier for an apostle than a pastor. Because apostles' responses are instinctively different than pastors. They instinctively see the kingdom, where the pastor instinctively sees the individual. Following along with this, the leadership team of the church has to be totally committed for the long haul to revival. Leadership, especially upper tier, must practice personal revival. Oh, we lay hands on this group many times. Leaders should be the first to receive prayer, not the last. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot lead or you are not going. In response to an accusation of being, yes, man, an elder at Hope Center said, of course, the Bible says we are to be like-minded. The voice of the people must never override the voice of the vision. For us, this leads to the role of the apostolic and prophetic. That grace must be input into the church to sustain revival. They are the foundations. You see, the default realm for these gifts is the Spirit, which is why they are so necessary to sustain revival. Fourth, I would say don't milk the cow dry. Keep it fresh. Know when to transition. Michael, you remember our discussions about stopping the 2000 meetings? That was a hard decision but we knew it was the right decision. We did not milk the cows dry. Michael Ivengood. I also remember after 17 straight nights of services, you and I talked about not exhausting the people. So we adjusted the schedule. Said Fawcett again. And he put it this way. Preach them hungry. Don't preach them full. Finally, in sustaining revival, do not assume people understand what you are talking about. Those who join you on the journey do not understand the past, so we must bring them up to speed. We may not always tell the whole story, but we must help people understand who we are. Of course, people learn differently. Schools teach differently now, and we have to understand that. We need to know how different parts of the church learn. But we must keep putting the revival in context. Keith Taylor. I know you asked for three or four, 
But let me mention five briefly. First, I think I have to talk about prayer. If prayer was essential in bringing it, it is essential in sustaining it. We are constantly seeking to keep a fresh prayer focus. Second, I would also talk about the five-fold covering. Revival or outpouring has been driven and maintained by recognizing and flowing with the five-fold ministries of the Holy Spirit. Number three, there has to be a heart for the lost. Cross Tabernacle has always been outward focused. And in revival, this has increased. A heart for the lost is a strong foundation stone for us. Michael Livingood. Keith, please mention a few components of this outreach. Keith Taylor again. We are involved in compassion ministries to our city. This includes our major focus on single parents every December. But it is more. It includes our annual joy walk where we distribute bottles of joy dishwashing detergent to poorer neighborhoods and pray with people. It involves our ice cream truck which gives away free popsicles in the same neighborhoods. It involves connecting with and releasing ministries to the felt needs. One of our staff leads this entire area of ministry. We also send out teams every week to witness and to and pray for people. This heart for the lost led us to support our local crisis pregnancy center and our local teen challenge center drug rehabilitation program. Recently, we took around 40 people to participate in evangelistic and compassion ministries to one of our first people nations. Michael Ivengood. On a side note, I love the mix on your staff. You personally have Native American blood in you. You have a staff member who is Iranian. Afro-American is a part of your leadership family. Uh, forgive my interruption. What are the other two factors you wanted to mention? Keith Taylor again. I believe a city church vision is important for sustaining outpouring. We pray with other leaders. Annually, we participate in a tent meeting led by another church. The area church expands our tents. I believe it is a Book of Acts model. Finally, I will mention a fivefold relationships. The ministry of apostles, prophets, and others have not only blessed the church, but relationships with other fivefold leaders creates accountability and integrity. Graham Renov. I tried to never lose sight to the big picture. Having been a part of an amazing church that has seen many moves of God with an international impact and is just as hungry for God to do what He wants to do, I am learning the following. I would suggest the challenge of learning how to flow where the Spirit is going. We need to be prepared to make adjustments. Leaders must be willing to be taught to make changes. However, the changes must come from our Heavenly Father's heart. So revival needs a constant revelation of the heart of the Father. Revival seems to always run the risk of complacency. So we have a challenge not to become complacent or take for granted the relationships God has given. Am I willing to adapt and make changes? Little foxes hinder where God wants to go. Second, we must find a way for revival not to be one generation only. We want it to be intergenerational. I have watched some second generation young people in revival saying, I do not want to make the same sacrifices my parents made. Well, my initial response was anger toward that person. Then I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, take a deep breath and listen. 
When I did, I began to see what some second generation church members saw. They saw broken families in some instances. They saw offspring of leaders probably burn out and did not want that for their families. There is a danger in revival that we can turn the next generation off. I suspect some of my generation neglected some foundational things in our lives that would have made us more well-rounded and holistic, which would have helped those who have followed. Finally, I think I'd have to emphasize five-fold leadership in the churches. There is a grace that can come on five-fold leaders to allow others to move in that flow. And that is really important for sustaining a move of God. Randall Burton, knowing that you can sustain is important. Move away from the idea that revival as a gifted speaker. You need to understand revival culture can become a part of who you are, not just an extended meeting. The revival God sends you might be different than others. That is, it may look different. It may help you to know that historically, Revival was not viewed as a positive by everybody when it was happening. For me, a second key issue is connections. It is important to be with the right people. These right people, other revival leaders, will help provide the right information you need for sustained revival. For us, I think another key to sustain revival has been the understanding and recognition of what an intercessor is. An intercessor is more than a gifted prayer person. Uh, by the way, from my perspective, there is no such thing as a gift of intercession. While some may be called to intercede, all are called to pray. I began to handpick a team of intercessors. Our prayer room went from the crying room for the spiritually immature to a room where a powerful team pokes holes in heaven. I would handpick intercessors. They pray what the house prays, not just the mantle, not just people who are fascinated with the thought of being an intercessor but rather people who are into the man. They are connected to the leader of the house. They are of the house. They carry the DNA of the house. Tony Collis, you have to give up to go up. When revival came in 2008, I gave up my preaching slot to you, Michael. When revival came, I gave up my respectability. When revival came, I gave up church agenda. When revival came, I gave up my own sensibilities. It's hard to look respectable from the floor or when you are as drunk in the spirit as you can be and laughing hilariously. In fact, I think every regressive step has been because either I or the church was not prepared to give something up. For example, revival comes, but it challenges our pride. For some in church, this can be a big struggle. Some are embarrassed by some of the things the Spirit does. So they step back. For revival to sustain, you have to keep on giving things up. You give up what you know for what you do not know. You must hold on to everything with a wide open hand. Michael Ivingood. Let's take one more look back before we take a look into the future. If you had it all to do over again, what would you do differently now? If anything, that is of course, other than getting a better evangelist, 
said Fawcett, the only major thing would be to adjust the Sunday morning service sooner. As a church, we were very hungry. But in the early days of revival, we did not do a great job of looking after the children. I probably would have worked more on making Sunday morning a family service rather than a revival service so as not to burn out our workers. I would watch over church life a bit closer. Watching over church life is important for sustaining the life of the church. The family service tends to build the congregation. A revival service tends to build the hunger. I would work on those ministries that help connect people to each other. We felt led to develop a cafe where people could share Sunday lunch. This has become very important for connecting people. I tell people our service on Sunday morning runs for three hours. The first 90 minutes uh, in the auditorium and the other 90 minutes in the cafe. We want to develop a culture of honor, which includes giving honor to other staff ministries. If I constantly allow the auditorium service to run too long for personal glory time, I am not showing honor to our children workers, cafe workers, and the like. We are members of one another. This does not mean we shut down the move of the Holy Spirit on Sunday mornings. Congregations will recognize the genuine move of the Spirit. We are seeking to give the Spirit freedom to move, but operating within a basic time frame. The preacher is not the main thing. It is more important that people meet with God than they, that, that they heard a good sermon. Now, obviously, I do believe a good sermon can help people meet with God. However, I am struck by this thought. The children of Israel camped around the presence of God while modern church camps around the sermon. The wind of John chapter 3 speaks of flexibility. So allow every service to feel different. Keith Taylor. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, with all jokes aside, the evangelist actually is a very strong key that many times is overlooked. A strong, dedicated evangelist keeps the Great Commission at the forefront of all that is happening. This is nuts and bolts in an outpouring. Souls must be a priority to sustain it. At the same time, the five-fold evangelist flows in an outpouring atmosphere differently than he flows in any other church setting. The five-fold evangelist is very glory aware. He follows and trusts the Holy Spirit to lead in totality, willing to be used by the Lord in an enlarged anointing. This includes allowing the personal packaging of a service to be forfeited, or better still, yielded to the flow of the Holy Spirit for that service. Graham Renoff. Hindsight is good, but I have a sneaky suspicion that God does not tell us everything about leading revival so that we will constantly be dependent upon Him. In other words, God will probably always leave us in the dark on some things. I could go through a whole list like I would have done a better job of communication with the church. I, I would have paid more attention to the pastoral care of the church. I would have tried to be more aware of my family needs, both in the church and in my own family. I would try to work more on bringing people with me and not driving them away. But to be honest, my bottom line is, I would not change anything. Even the mistakes we made were used by God 
to develop trust and other godly character. Faith relates to what we have not yet seen. There's an old book that we read that talks about leaning on God. Keep pressing in closer to God. That is what I always want to do better. Randall Burton. The first would be to pay more attention to church life as the outpouring unfolds. One of the tendencies is to blow off church life, including Sunday school, youth, and other groups. But that is detrimental. The church life, discipleship, and the like are extremely important. However, now we do them with a, a revival DNA. I think I would have met more often with my leaders early on. I would take them with me uh, to stuff I was going to, <clears throat> Michael Leibigan. Who would these leaders have been? Randall Burton again. Oh, you know, staff, elders, key people, anybody who pushes a mop or carries a microphone needs to go to revival. Do not assume your DNA is in them. You have to develop it in them. People will come in who do not have your DNA, so it must be developed in them. Take people with you. Sometimes the journey is as important as the destination. If your people go to revivals and so forth with you, they will realize you are not just on vacation. Tony Collis. Unfortunately for us, the issue of revival became the two camps. Some were pro-revival and others were anti-revival. In hindsight, I would try to talk to the leaders of the second camp on a pastoral level to seek to provide uh, personal encouragement and talk challenges through with them. I did do that, but in hindsight, I would have started earlier. We may have been able to hold off some of the issues. Hoping they would get on board was not enough. I should have engaged them before we lost them from revival. On the positive side of this issue, it increased my humility and personal growth. This one may be very subjective, but in hindsight, I should have delayed the family holiday that we took in the middle of those 19 weeks. The holiday was important, but I feel I lost some connection with what God was doing and with the momentum of revival. I was prepared to give up the church agenda and those kinds of things. Now, I think it would have been good to have delayed the holiday. My family would have accepted it. I definitely should have taken more time to rest during the revival. Revival could be physically demanding, and I should have rested more. I would place more value on prayer. I could have given some church stuff to others so that I could have protected the place of prayer. I believe the leader of the house can protect that place more than any other person can. I would give up other stuff to protect the value of prayer. I also found I would have approached differently the challenge between local and national ministry the balance between personal ministry and the local church. A national ministry is opening up to me, but I am finding I would rather spend time in the prayer room. Michael Livingood, I believe your thoughts and experiences will help others who are in the white waters of revival. Now let's move on to looking into the future. What is your heart or vision for future revival? Seth Fawcett. Citywide transformation. Our responsibility is to take responsibility for the presence of God in our city. Write it 
in the fabric of your church. The DNA of Hope Center is to spread revival as a church to the nation and nations. I do not have a separate ministry name because I want Hope Center to send me. We believe Hope Center's mandate is to stir up revival. Our oldies, senior citizens group, love feeling like they are touching Germany. I travel as a part of Hope Center. Keith Taylor. I know I can't go back to the times prior to outpouring. My heart is to pursue His glory as He leads. I have seen the Holy Spirit through the years adjust the services constantly, changing the comfort zones of His moving. I want to stay in His flow, which simply means being in a constant state of His leadership. That, my friend, always involves sea and river crossings. My heart is to go out stronger than when I stepped in. Outpouring has become, I believe, the calling God placed on me many years ago at a kitchen table. I find it amusing now that I was an instrument of praise and writing songs. Interesting that from that point on, I became a driven man for the presence of the Lord the rest of my days. From that kitchen table visitation, my life has been a constant drive toward His presence. Graham Reniff. God's heart is that no one should perish. I just want to be a part of what I believe I have seen in the Spirit that God is going to do in the States and New Zealand. I believe the greatest outpourings are yet to come. I want to be positioned for the wave that is coming. So I must get closer to Him. I want to be actively doing what the Father is doing. I believe the fivefold is going to be huge for the future. Grand Uberton. Well, beyond leading a healthy, growing church, with the revival culture, I want to see my city enmeshed in revival. I believe the heart of the Father is for His kingdom. When I wrote the book, River Rising, I wrote there's a difference between a river flowing and a river that has gone outside the banks into the community. That is what I want to see. Ecclesiastes 1.7 says, All rivers run into the sea. Revival is all about that. I want to see an impact on the nation. This outpouring revival must go into the sea. Tony Collis, I don't ever want to stop believing for an even greater revival. I'm wide open to that. I want to make room for it at the slightest whiff. I intend to embrace the ugly with the beautiful. I understand ugly will happen, but I will focus on the beauty. It is in my heart to see my family engaged in revival, even as I want to try to protect them from the ugly part. I accept that revival will forever define me. The year 2000 changed me forever. 2008 was that ten times over. Michael Leifigan. It would be interesting to explore some of those remarks a bit more. But let's wrap up this discussion with one more question. What would be the three or four things that are at the top of your list that a pastor in revival needs to understand? Seth Fawcett. Number one is your church leadership has to be totally committed to a new reality, a restoration to normality. Number two, recognize the need for five-fold ministry influence in your local church. Number three, understand that whatever it takes to get a move of God will be required to sustain a move of God. Watch distractions. 
Finally, every human being has two instincts. One is to breathe, the other is to drink. Breathing brings life, but drinking sustains life. Solid food given too soon will kill a baby. So the Bible says drink more than eat. Too many moves of God kill the baby because they give the baby solid food too soon. Keith Taylor. Revival will not be sustained without prayer. This is both personal and corporate. Number two, revival will only be sustained by passion. This is a passion for souls, a passion for His Word, passion for praise and worship. Number three, outpouring is all about presence. To sustain this presence involves changing the atmosphere and the culture of your church and then your city. Last, a five-fold leadership model is essential. This includes covering, relationships, and accountability. Graham Reniff, your personal relationship with God must be maintained. Make it the primary thing to seek His face without compromise. No going back. Give Him room to move. I would encourage you to trust the God that is in you. Resist the temptation to lower the standard to where the people are, but rather bring them up to where you are. Pastoring by default is about people, but revival is about Him. Don't pander to the soul, but keep the focus on the Spirit. As you seek to keep hunger levels maintained, Remember to lead rather than push the people. Bring the people with you. There are exceptions. You cannot please all the people, so do not become a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser. Randall Burton. I think I would want to say, first of all, it really is not about you. Don't assume anything. Don't assume your church is on board or your city or your friends. Realize this is a process, not an event or season. It is a lifestyle lived out through a leader who is sold out for God, who does not have any recourse except to go forward. Realize there is nothing to go back to. You have to live it, sleep it, eat it. Do not allow Pharisees to keep you from doing that. You must pastor people and work with pastors whose people want to go with you and want to change churches. You are uncompromisingly going after revival. And that, my friend, concludes chapter number 11 of The Wow Factor, the heart and soul, very probably, of this book. I trust that the reading has been a blessing to you. I will look forward to coming together, together, together again soon to read chapter number 12, Can You Grow a Church and Have Revival?